As you watch this teaching, please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see this message. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Welcome to the program. Today we're going to return to the book of Jude, but before we do, I have a personal prayer request, and I'm asking you to pray with me and for me and for Denise, for our family and for our ministry. As you know, we're coming to you from Moscow, Russia. This studio really is in Moscow, and our part of the world has really been shaken by many, many events. And we're navigating very turbulent times, but we're anointed to do it. But my friend, I need you to pray for us. Russia has just been shaken with sanction after sanction, but yet this is our place. This is where God has called us. And from here, we're taking the teaching of the Bible to the ends of the earth. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, the apostle Paul said, preach the word, we're doing that. Then he added, be instant in season and out of season. Amazingly, those words, be instant, are a military term that commanded soldiers to stay at their post. Denise and I, our sons, our ministry, we're staying at our post. We know this is our place of assignment. But then Paul added, be instant in season and out of season. The words in season is actually the Greek word akairos, which means when times are good. But the word out of season means when times are bad, which means we're to stay at our post regardless of the weather, regardless of the atmosphere. If we know where God has called us, we're to stay there and we're to do what we've been charged to do. And that's what I'm doing. That's what Denise and our sons and our team are doing. But I'm asking you to pray for us because right now, we're really navigating very turbulent times. And so it's unusual for me to ask you to pray for us like this. But my friend, I'm telling you, we really need your prayers and we need wisdom from above. And we have it because we're promised the mind of Christ in Philippians chapter two. And we're anointed because the same anointing that is upon Jesus is upon us. And we as a family and as a ministry, we're really anointed for where we are and for what we're doing. But we're going to preach the word regardless of what's going on around us. And that's why we're going to continue today in the book of Jude. But we're offering you a brand new series this week, brand new, just starting today, called Mockers in the Last Days. The subtitle says, what the Bible says about mockers in the last days and how to stand strong against a tide of negative voices. And of course, it comes with a wonderful study guide so that you can read it while you get the teaching down deep inside you. And we're also offering you today for free, free today only, my book, which is called Last Days Survival Guide, a scriptural handbook to prepare you for these perilous times. We're living in treacherous, perilous times. But if we'll pay attention to what the Bible has told us about these times, we'll be equipped to sail through these turbulent waters that applies to me and that applies to you. But today, we want to give this to you as our gift. Just reach out to us right now. Give us a call or go online. And by the way, at the end of the program today, my announcer is going to tell you how you can get all of these materials. But today, I want you to reach for your Bible. We always use the Bible in this program. We preach the Word. We stay at our post in season and out of season. And today, that's what we're doing. And we're going to return to the book of Jude. And I'm going to read to you today a few verses from the RIV. You say, well, what is the RIV? Well, let me read to you directly from my notes so you'll understand what is the RIV. The RIV is an abbreviation for the Renner Interpretive Version, and here's what it is. The RIV is a conceptual interpretation of the New Testament that draws on concepts in the Greek language and brings them into the text in a contemporary way to provide a broader comprehension of what is being communicated through Scripture. To be clear, the RIV is not meant to be viewed as a word-for-word -word translation, but should be viewed as a conceptual interpretation of the Greek text. And today we're going to begin in verse 3. I'm going to read to you the RIV. And I want you to remember that Jude 
had the intention to write an epistle about salvation and all the benefits of salvation. He was so excited to do it because Jesus was his half-brother, his elder brother who died on the cross, who was raised from the dead to purchase all these benefits for us, and Jude really wanted to write about what Jesus purchased for us. But when he was getting ready to write his epistle, he suddenly received the second letter of Peter and read chapter 2 and chapter 3 and was so deeply moved by what Peter wrote about false teachers and false teachers who were covertly working their way into the church that Jude said, hey, I'm going to scrap my plans to write about the benefits of salvation and I'm going to address what Peter addressed and I'm going to build on top of it. So now that leads us to the RIV of Jude verse 3, which says, Beloved, I call you that because it's the only word I know to express how deeply I love and cherish you. I fully intended to write to you about our mutually shared salvation. And I was really eager to write about this exciting subject, ready to engage all of my creative abilities to dive deep into all the benefits that our salvation entails. But as I was about to get started, I found myself gripped with a sense of urgency and a deeply felt need to address another subject that came to my attention. I felt someone needed to come alongside the troops, to urge them to hold their head high, to throw their shoulders back, and if needed, to look the enemy eyeball to eyeball and to earnestly contend for the faith because it is under assault. God entrusted the faith to us once and for all and expects us to guard it and maintain its integrity in the same form it was in when it was delivered to us. And God has given us the responsibility to impart it to others in the same form as it was when we received it. Then the RIV of verse 4 says, But unfortunately... We are now confronted with a certain category of individuals who have clandestinely, almost like a stealth operation, craftily wormed their way right into the middle of our ranks. Long ago, it was foretold and written in advance that a day would come when such individuals would show up. But in the end, heaven's court will issue a damning verdict of judgment and condemnation on them due to their activities. I'm talking about people who were once reverent and God-fearing, but now they've lost their fear of God. These are individuals who will go about altering, changing, and modifying the grace of our God into a teaching that says everything is okay and that leads to sinful living that is especially marked by immoral and indecent sexual activities along with other base behaviors. And they can't claim ignorance about what they're doing because the Lord God that is our Lord Jesus Christ, has spoken to them and warned them to get back in line. But in spite of these warnings the Lord has given them, they knowingly are denying and walking away from the authoritative covering of the Lord. Now that is the RIV of Jude verse 3 and 4. And now we're going to jump to the RIV of verse 8 where he continues to describe these people that have veered from their faith. And listen to what he says in Jude verse 8. This is the RIV. In the very same identical way, these dreamers have shockingly convinced themselves that what they do and condone is all right. They go about defiling the flesh and they show total disregard to those with authority and out of a complete disdain for spiritual authority, they audaciously speak debasing, nasty, shameful, ugly words toward those that are in authority with a purpose to belittle them and to put them down. Now the RIV of verse 9. I tell you amazingly that even Michael, the tremendously powerful archangel, at the moment when he was wrangling and going back and forth with the devil in a fierce and really hot debate concerning the body of Moses, even he did not cross the line and get into judgment with the devil, nor did he try to take retribution against him, nor did he get dragged into speaking insulting and humiliating words in an attempt to inflict the devil with pain, but instead he simply said, The Lord rebuke you. Now the RIV of verse 10. But the people I'm talking about to you right now speak atrociously 
and inappropriately about things they absolutely do not comprehend or even have a clue about. To be honest, they know and operate from a natural, low-level instinct, a lot like animals that lack intelligence. That explains why their standing in life is so degenerate, depraved, and totally messed up. Then you come to the RAV of verse 11. I say woe to these people because they've abandoned what they once held to be true to follow after the same path of Cain for the sake of financial gain. They've given themselves fully to error and lost their bearings and are now completely morally adrift. And as a result, they've ruined, devastated, and destroyed themselves. Their mutinous, rebellious, subversive attitudes and speech is a lot like those that marked Korah, referring to Korah who rebelled against Moses in the Old Testament. Then the RIV of verse 12. These people are unthinkably right in your midst, fearlessly, sumptuously feasting at your love feasts. But such people are like dangerous reefs in the sea with potential to produce moral and spiritual shipwreck in people's lives. And there they are among you, self-focused, tending to their own needs, taking care of themselves. They're like clouds that fill the sky that look like they carry water. But contrary to the image they give to others about themselves, they are spiritually dry as a desert and completely void of spiritual water. These people are like turbulent winds that bring a lot of destruction in people's lives and they're hard to nail down because they're constantly on the move. Fruit producing trees should bear fruit in season, but they have absolutely no fruit to show for themselves. They're spiritually like a plant that's been torn from its roots out of the soil then you come to the RIV of verse 13. The behavior of the people I'm describing are uncontrollable and unpredictable, like raging waves of the sea that are constantly rising and falling and always on the move. And just as waves in the sea churn up a lot of foam and drag up junk from the bottom of the sea, these folks stir up trouble, spit up spiritual vomit, spiritually froth back and forth and produce a mess out of their own disgrace, dishonor, and indignity. And like stars that have lost their orbit and veered off track, they have moved out of their God-appointed orbit and roam and wander about. But a day is coming when these wanderers who have veered off track and lost their way will be permanently placed and forever kept in a nearly unimaginable dark and gloomy place that is obscure, that is, a never-ending darkness that is mute of all light, and they will be held there into the vast expanse of all eternity. Now that is amazing. I'm telling you, the book of Jude is not for the lighthearted. These are powerful, powerful verses. And then you come to verse 14. And in verse 14, we find that from the very outset of history, Enoch saw the emergence of these individuals and he even saw the coming of the Lord. And from the very beginning of the book of Genesis, Enoch prophesied what was going to take place at the end of the age. And that is why verse 14 says, and Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. But notice in verse 14 it says, And Enoch also, the word also is a translation of the Greek word day, a conjunction, which describes a startling point or something that is absolutely amazing. And Enoch also amazingly, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these. The word prophesied is a compound of two Greek words, the word pro, which describes something that is done in advance, and the word phemi, which means to speak. But when you compound the two words together, it means to speak, to articulate, or to communicate something in advance, or to speak prophetically. And again, from the very outset of time, God already knew what was going to happen at the very, very end of the ages. And Enoch, the seventh from Adam, was allowed to see to the end of the ages and what did he prophesy? He prophesied in advance of these, saying, Behold. The word behold is the Greek word idu. The word idu carries the idea of shock or bewilderment. And here it injects the sentiment 
of Enoch into what he is about to prophesy. It's almost the equivalent of Enoch saying, wow, it is amazing what I have just seen. Behold, the Lord cometh. The word Lord in Greek is capital. It's the Greek word kurios. It describes the Lord, the supreme master, the one with absolute authority over the known and unknown realm, visible and invisible realm. He's saying there's no one greater or more powerful or with more authority than the Lord. And he says, I see the Lord coming. And the word cometh in the King James translation is a translation of the word parousia. And I'm going to read you from my notes because this is so very important. This word cometh, the Greek word parousia, is a technical word used to depict the royal visit of a king or emperor or the arrival of one who alone had the authority and powerful to, power to right wrongs and to set things in order. And the use of parousia in this verse tells us that when Christ comes as king and emperor, he will come with the authority and power to right every wrong in the world and to set everything in proper order. And the fact that Enoch, the seventh from Adam saw the coming of Christ at such an early point in human history emphatically tells us that the ultimate redemptive plan of God has always been at work even since the very beginning of human history. And Enoch says, The Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. The word with is the Greek word in. It's a preposition, which means Christ will come right in the very middle of ten thousands Ten thousands, the Greek word murias, it describes ten thousands or an innumerable company of his saints. The word saints describes those that have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, those that are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus comes in his second advent, he's going to come with an innumerable company of saints. And the RIV of Jude verse 14 is as follows. It is amazing that even Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied and foretold in advance about these and other events that would occur in the future, saying, Behold, the Lord is coming with the authority and powerful needed to right every wrong and to set everything in order. And when he comes, he will arrive in the midst of ten thousands, innumerable numbers of his holy people with him. And then when you look at verse 15, the King James Version says, to execute judgment upon all and to convict all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of their hard speeches which they have ungodly sinners have spoken against him. But you'll notice in verse 15, the word ungodly appears four times. Well, any time one truth is repeated four times in one verse. You better pay close attention because the Holy Spirit is saying something very important. But notice the very beginning of verse 15 says, He is coming to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them. Let's begin right there. First of all, the word judgment is the word crisis, which means when Jesus comes, it's going to really be a crisis for those that are ungodly and who have not repented. And the word crisis, this Greek word that is used here, translated judgment, was really the term used to describe a decision made by a legal court. It was a court decree, a legal procedure at the court, or a verdict delivered that results in judgment, which means heaven is watching, and heaven is observing, and heaven will issue a court decree upon all, and the word upon, is the Greek word kata. And the word kata in Greek is a preposition which here means against, but it carries the idea of a strike against them so strong that it will be inescapable. Upon all, the word all, the Greek word pantas, which means all, it is all-inclusive. It means with no exceptions, everyone that has never repented, everyone that has lived ungodly, every single one of them are going to experience this judgment and the Bible goes on to say, and he's coming to convince all that are ungodly among them. And the word convince is another legal term. It means to expose, to convict, or to cross-examine for the purpose of conviction as when convicting a lawbreaker in a court of law. It pictures a lawyer 
who brings forth evidence that is indisputable and undeniable, and it means that in that day, heaven's court will present all the proof necessary to irrefutably back up a charge of guilt against the ungodly. God is going to bring forth all the evidence to prove those so charged really are guilty. That is amazing. And it says to convince all that are ungodly among them. What does the word ungodly mean? Well, again, it appears four times in this verse. And every time it appears, it is the Greek word asebes. From the word sebes, the word sebes describes something that is reverent, pious, or God-fearing. But when you put an A on the front, it has a reversing or a canceling effect. It is those who have become irreverent, those that have become impious, those that have lost their fear of God. And here, it depicts those whose actions and lives are unholy, unsacred, impure. Their activities are unsanctioned by God. It describes those who live sinful lives and whose behavior demonstrates they possess no reverence for that which is holy. And when Jesus comes in his second advent with ten thousands and ten thousands and an innumerable company of saints all around him, he will come to bring judgment or to execute a verdict upon those that have refused to repent. And now Jude describes that very vividly in this verse. And when we come back in the next program, this is where we're going to pick up and continue. This verse is just jammed packed. But we're out of time, but I'll be back in just a moment. I'm going to pray for you. But right now, my announcer is going to tell you how you can get all of the materials which we're offering to you today. The Bible says one of the signs we've come to the end of the age is there will be mockers who mock and make fun of the rest of us who believe Jesus is coming soon for his church. In fact, the Holy Spirit said these mockers will appear right before the closure of the church age. What exactly does the Bible tell us about this? And why is it taking so long for Jesus to return? In the series, Mockers in the Last Days, Rick Renner opens the scriptures to show us what the apostles prophesied over and over about events in the last days. In this five-part series, Rick covers Enoch's prophecy about the last days, murmurers and complainers in the last days, mockers in the last days, and the good news that Jesus is coming soon. This five-part series is available in digital or physical format starting at just $10. And today only, Rick's book, Last Day's Survival Guide, is available as our free gift to you. Call the number on your screen or visit renner.org. Free, today only, when you call or go online to request it. This book is a must-read for you to know what the Bible tells us about the end of the age and how to navigate the times we're living in right now. Ensure your foundation stays strong and secure so you will be unshaken and can live victoriously through this end time season. Get the book Last Day's Survival Guide for free today. And don't miss this powerful teaching series, Mockers in the Last Days. Call the number on your screen now or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. Friends, this is Rick Renner. And today I wanna say thank you, thank you, thank you for helping us to victoriously finish phase one of our ministry expansion project, which was purchasing our Tulsa headquarters building and building the building for our new studio in Moscow. That studio is an anchor for the Word of God. And together we did it. We finished phase one. And then you faithfully stayed with us through phase two and you gave again to help us finish the interior of the studio. And I wanna say thank you so much. But now in front of us, is phase three. You say, well, what is phase three? Phase three is paying off the Tulsa building. Now, right now, I'm in the interior of the Moscow Good News Church. It is quite an amazing place. When you walk through this building, it's so beautiful and it testifies to the grace of God and the provision of God and the giving of our church and of our partners. We built this facility debt-free and because of that, the Moscow Church has never had the burden of monthly payments. All of our funds have been released to do the work of the gospel. And now we need to do that in Tulsa, and I call this Phase 3. And I'm asking you today to pray about joining us as part of the giving team for Phase 3, which is paying off the Tulsa facility. And the reason we want to pay it off 
is because then it will release funds for us to take the teaching of the Bible to the ends of the earth. And dear friend, right now, the Bible is so needed. And I know that that's my heart and that is your heart. And together, we can take the Bible to the ends of the earth. So please pray about joining us for phase three to finish paying off the Tulsa building. And I want to say thank you in advance. I want to thank you for being with me today. And if you're a partner with our ministry, thank you for being a partner with our ministry. Together, we are making a difference in people's lives. Proverbs 10, 21 says, The lips of the righteous feed many. Our lips are righteous. Your lips are righteous. And together, we're feeding many people the Word of God through this program. And we're feeding them the Word of God all over the world. I wish you could see the list of the nations that are tuning in to receive the verse-by-verse -verse teaching of the Bible on this program. It is amazing. And my friend, as a partner, you are a part of that because you're putting fuel in the tank to make it happen. And if you're not a partner, please pray about becoming a partner with our ministry. You can become a partner by going online or by giving us a call. A partner is anyone who regularly financially supports our ministry. And the moment you become a partner, we're going to send you Denise's book called The Gift of Forgiveness, which is our gift to anyone that becomes a partner, and my book called Life in the Combat Zone, which is dedicated to partners. We'll get these right to you and we'll welcome you into our partner family. And this week, we're offering you a brand new series, which is called Mockers in the Last Days. What the Bible says about mockers in the last days and how to stand strong against a tide of negative Voices is five parts. It comes in multiple formats and it comes with a study guide. And the study guide is amazing. We put so much work into these study guides. And in these study guides are all the Greek words, all the points, all the principles that is in the series so that you can read it while you see it or while you hear it. But you can get this by going online or by giving us a call. And today only, today only, we're offering you for free my book called Last Day's Survival Guide. There on the cover is a picture of boots and a Bible. This is the end time season, my friends, and we need to grab our boots and grab our Bible and get ready to march through these last days. And we can do it in victory because we have the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost, and we have the Bible in our hearts and in our hands. The subtitle says, A Scriptural Handbook to Prepare You for These Perilous Times. And today only, we want to send this to you as a gift from our ministry. You can get all of these things by giving us a call right now, or you can go online. And please remember to let us know how to pray for you. When you reach out to this ministry, you don't get away from us without really being prayed for. So call us or send us your email. And the moment we hear from you, we're going to really release our faith for Jesus to do something magnificent for you. But Father, I thank you today for the Word of God, and I thank you that you really are coming. Oh, Lord. The second advent is in front of us. And Lord, when you show up, it's going to be a wonderful day for the righteous. It's going to be a crisis for the unrighteous. So Lord, we pray for our friends that need to come to Christ. We pray, Lord, they would repent in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll see you tomorrow. But please remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, that really is power. If you enjoyed that teaching, please like, subscribe, and comment so more people can see it.